uh, my name is Adam, and today I'm going to be talking about the challenges and lessons that uh, I faced and learned while trying to hire for my startup, Playlog. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm currently the Playlog CTO and co-founder. We have two other founders, um, our CEO, Justin, as well as now our new uh, chief uh, marketing officer. But before this, I was running a company called Throwaway Games for around seven years. Uh, and while I was doing throwaway games, my primary focus was in uh, game development, web development, and app development. So throwaway games, we did our own in-house stuff, but most of our money came through from uh, doing contract work and consultation for people. Uh, so I I listed some of my tech, the technologies that I've used in the past. So 3D uh, Unity 3D, Marmalade, WebGL, Laravel, Ionic, whole bunch of other stuff. I've, I've been all over the place, but the primary thread has been working with media of some type. So whether it's um, processing images or video or audio files to writing uh, 3D shaders, working with 3D models in the browser, uh, if, it's, if it's media that's consumable, I've probably touched it in some format. Uh, and during my uh, education process, I went to school uh, at, at uh, Humber College for their game programming course. And it was specifically geared towards uh, engine development. And I was still pretty new in my uh, uh, programming journey. So I didn't understand the difference between uh, making a game and making a game engine. I, I bring this up as one of the, uh, the filters that I had to work through, not only through my career, but when, when hiring as well is, uh, the different areas uh, that you can experience as a developer. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more uh, as, as we continue. So uh, let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, it's 2017. I'm still working at Throwaway Games. And uh, I'm introduced to Justin uh, to help him get his, uh, his company off the ground. He's got a prototype for an app. It lets you uh, record some audio and record, uh, place a, an image with it, a couple images, and do like a slideshow voiceover type of thing. And he has the idea of building it out into a social media platform. So obviously our audience is going to be on mobile devices. Based off of some of the specifications that we got from him, we knew that we need a web presence so that people could uh, see what we were doing without having to download the app because it's going to be social media, obviously we need somewhere to store all this. So we're going to need to have some type of a back end going on this. Another thing as well, I'm still working at Throwaway Games at the time, working as a, as a consultant and as a contractor. So the idea that we had was I was going to help him get a team going to go from early, early stage prototype to a working MVP. And after uh, getting an initial team going, help him find some solid long-term technical leadership to continue the process. I didn't realize I was gonna be that technical leadership at the time, but uh, because of that, that also influenced the decision-making process in who we were gonna hire. So now that we know who I am and uh, why we're hiring and what, we're, what it is generally we're gonna do, uh, what are the questions that we need to answer in order for us to successfully start to build our team? So question number one, or I guess number zero in uh, programmer lingo, can you work with the founders? It doesn't matter how smart you are or how fast you can develop if you're not good at working with the rest of the team. In this particular scenario, the future CTO could be anybody. So I can't even come up with some type of a prediction as to the, the personality of this person. So whoever we're bringing on board, they need to be able to uh, generally be agreeable, I guess is a way that you can, you can phrase it. Uh, and as for myself, even though we were looking to hire a CTO down the road, until we got that, I was going to be the primary uh, uh, technical leadership there. So they would also have to be able to interact with me. And I have a rather casual conversational style, but I also tend to uh, think pretty far into the future. Uh, you can call it anxiety. I call it uh, part of my job description. Uh, but that's, that's the type of thing that uh, you're going to need to deal with if you're working with me specifically. Uh, and then there's also uh, our CEO. Uh, he is not a technical person. He knows what he wants to build. He understands the industry that he's enter entering, but he doesn't know the difference between what uh, HTML is versus an API. Uh, so you're going to need to be able to communicate to him 
what it is you're doing in a way that's going to make him feel confident that we're moving in a, in a good direction. And these points have proven to be true over the course of the past three and a half years that we've, we've been doing this is that uh, anybody who, if there's, if there's friction, but uh, between somebody that we hire and uh, one of our founders uh, early on, that doesn't really seem to uh, clear up. So there's, there's certain personality cues that you can pick up on pretty early on, at least in our particular uh, scenario. So next question is, what is it that we actually need right now? Uh, in order to answer that, uh, a roadmap is generally strongly advisable. I like to look at roadmaps uh, in a, a scenario where you look at the short-term requirements, the medium-term requirements, the long-term requirements. Short-term requirements are with the next six months or so, uh, and you know really clearly what it is that you're trying to achieve. The midterm are the things that you're going to be doing after that. So it requires you to have successfully completed the uh, short-term requirements, and you have a fairly good idea of what it's going to be, but it may still be somewhat vague. And then long-term, those are your hopes, your dreams, your desires, but they're not set in stone. They're subject to change uh, somewhat wildly, depending on what happens in the first and second stages. We're in our first stage of the roadmap, uh, and we've done a little bit of technical talking as to what we're going to be working on first. And so we've identified that we need to hire some mobile developers, uh, back-end developer, and a front-end web developer. From the mobile to developer standpoint, we have a few options. So uh, do we want to hire one Android person, one iOS person? Do we want to just focus on iOS, or do we want to go hybrid? Um, the reason why hybrid is on that list is because, as I've mentioned previously, my uh, background outside of games is in web. So I'm very familiar with hybrid-based apps, and there's a time and a place for them. You can hear some uh, developers, particularly those who are uh, primarily experienced with native applications, claiming that you can't get uh, a hybrid application that is as responsive as a native application. But that's really dependent on what it is you're building, how intensive it is, and who it is that's developing it. Right. Um, if you're trying to build something that's, for example, like a simple list app, you can absolutely go hybrid. If you're trying to do something like what Playlog is doing, where you need to be doing uh, editing of audio and editing of large files and things that are going to be potentially computationally expensive, you don't want the extra UI overhead of using an, uh, a hybrid app at that point. So we decided not to go hybrid. Um, and there was another option of just focusing on iOS. Uh, you'll hear a lot of times uh, when people are entering into the mobile space that people on Android don't spend money. So you really only need to worry about uh, your iOS users if you want to make money. But the problem with that is, in particular, if you're working on something that requires a critical mass of users in order to actually make some money, is that nobody knows who you are. You don't have any social proof. Nobody wants to use your app yet until somebody that they know is using your app. So if you've got some type of uh, celebrity on board to hype you up, or you've got a huge marketing budget right off the bat, and you don't need to worry about capturing as many eyeballs as you possibly can, then iOS makes sense. Uh, and especially because you don't need to worry about uh, managing multiple projects at once. But in our situation, because we're looking to uh, penetrate as broad a market as possible. We decided that we we're going to actually hire two developers, uh, one for iOS, one for Android, and move forward uh, with that assumption. In regards to our backend work, um, uh, we decided to go with a PHP framework called Laravel, largely because that's what I know. Um, my experience isn't in native app development. It was in uh, web development. And you don't want to start a new project using something that you're not familiar with because you're going to run into problems. And when you're on a budget, the unexpected problems are the most costly. So at least from this perspective, we knew PHP, there's going to be a lot of developers. Um, a lot of the PHP developers aren't necessarily, uh, there, there's there's some bad reputation in regards to PHP code quality. And I, I feel that it has to do with um, the ecosystems that the developer has worked in. So having my own background in there, I'm able to uh, narrow in on the, the developers who have good habits and are actually going to be beneficial to our long-term goals. 
And then in regards to front end, we derive that from our back end. Global Arvel uses a front end framework called UJS right out the box, rather than trying to uh, stick on a new framework and trying to figure out how that's going to work. We decided to just stick with the the, the out of the box solution to get ourselves out the door and uh, build something that will get us to a point where if we have a reason to like move to React or something down the road, we'll we'll already have an established uh, uh, company going, and it will it will not be as much of a uh, uh, technical threat at that point. Another question that we have to answer in regards to what do we really need is: Are we looking for an eng engineer or are we looking for a product developer? Now, when you're uh, titling software developers, whether it's yourself or others. Um, there's a lot of uh, ambiguity in regards to what titles to use where and how you can label yourself. Um, basically, anybody uh, who does software development of any kind can call themselves a software engineer, but for our purposes, I refer to engineers as people who try to solve abstract problems using lower level technologies versus a product developer who tries to solve specific problems using tools that engineers have developed for them. Uh, again, not necessarily formal, but uh, we found it to be particularly effective when we're trying to categorize uh, developers. Uh, and for our needs right now, as much as I would like for us to be able to do, do engineering and start playing around with uh, fancy type of uh, image filters or uh, anything like that, uh, crazy uh, optimizations, new file formats, we just need to get a product out still. We need to take uh, find uh, the existing tools that are going to serve our needs the best and put them together in a way that is going to be as polished as possible so that we can have a high quality consumer facing product, not something that is going to excite other developers. Um, okay, so, sorry. Some other things uh, that we need to uh, identify uh, or that we need and who we hire. We want people who are gonna grow with us. One of the easiest ways to get a raise <laughs> or a pay increase as a developer is to find a new job which uh, is fine for an individual developer in the short term, but in the as, as far as the development ecosystem goes, I personally feel that this is a, a bad way to go about things because um, all the knowledge that is um, developed in that individual that you hired is going to leave. And then you have to train new people. Um, so we try to keep that in mind and uh, hire people who have the type of mentality that they're not gonna be looking to jump from place to place to just to try and get a pay increase. They're working somewhere because they actually like what they, it is that they're doing. They believe in the company uh, and they see that there is uh, potential for them to grow both professionally and financially. Uh, part uh, and parcel with this is we would like to hire people who have the potential to be future leaders. Um, if we, we start off as a small team and we slowly grow and we keep those people, um, we want the best people in the best roles, but we also want to reward the people who have been there long enough um, or been there with us by day one. So yeah, that's, that's a bit of a struggle because not everybody who is a solid developer is necessarily going to be a good leader or, and they don't necessarily want to be, they don't have to be, but that's something that we look out for ideally. Um, and affordability. So again, this is back in 2017. We have nothing built yet. We don't know if this company is actually gonna have legs. So how much money is uh, a poor co-founder uh, willing to pour into this out of his own pocket <laughs> before uh, we have some type of validation? We wanna get the best people possible so that we have the best chance of success, but we have limited funds. So that is the, the, the never ending struggle there, right? And uh, of course, our needs change over time. So as we go through uh, hiring cycles, some of these things stay the same, but some of them uh, adjust. The next question is, what actually is a senior developer? Uh, this is another one that is uh, uh, hard to put your finger on. It, the definitions change depending on who you're talking to. Some people will look at senior as purely a function of time. I've been developing for 10 years, so therefore I'm a senior developer. Some people will look at it as I'm really, really good. I know absolutely everything about my language of choice. Therefore, I'm a senior developer. Um, from my perspective, you're going to want a combination of both of those, right? Um, knowing everything about your technical um, stack is fantastic. But the fact of the matter is, is that there are going to be challenges that you 
are not going to be able to face until you've spent time working in real world environments. You have the unknowns coming at you. You have users talking to you. You have unreasonable requests from your manager. Um, that is part of senior development, right? And so finding, again, that's a tricky balance to, to find because you don't want people who are um, stuck in their ways. You don't want people who are too fresh. You want that eagerness. Uh, you want everything. You want the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything, right? Um, so some of the things that I look for in regards to whether or not somebody is actually at the a senior level that is reasonable for us is what are their transferable skills, right? Um, if they're moving uh, across a bunch of different backend languages, uh, are they able to take what they learned in uh, Node and transfer it into uh, Ruby? Uh, they're completely different languages, uh, so you're not going to be looking at the language syntax, but are you, but you're probably going to be looking at um, what type of issues did I have in Ruby? I'm uh, in Node. Now I'm using Ruby. It does these types of things, so I'm going to have to look at it this way. And that that type of uh, knowledge growth. Uh, and design patterns as well. Uh, design patterns are more of a um, transferable item, but you will have things where you have a particular framework that works in a particular uh, design pattern. So uh, MVC is, is the big one for the back end, but then you have MVVC, right? Uh, and you have some other ones. Do you know what your what design patterns you're using, what they mean, and how you can apply them on your own outside of having a pre-existing package put into your lap? Um, another thing is in regards to your thought process and how you uh, educate yourself, how you continue to learn. Um, do you uh, drill down onto a topic? Do you broaden your scope? Or do you just uh, find somewhere that you're comfortable and you're like, this is it, and I'm just going to keep doing this over and over and over again? There's pros and cons to each of these. Um, narrowing in, you can, again, get very, very uh, specific knowledge on a particular technology, which can be good when you're trying to do those types of engineering tasks. Uh, but again, if you're not able to uh, uh, shift your focus at all, then if something unknown comes up, then you're not gonna be uh, as adaptable. Um, but if, you're, if you get too broad, then you're gonna have the uh, jack of all trades, master of none type of situation, right? So you wanna make sure that you are keeping uh, in touch with uh, the ecosystem that you are working in and the new developments that are going on in there, the new languages that are coming up, even if you're not using them, just to know what's going on and why people are doing certain things at certain times. Uh, and I have here uh, a link to a particular PHP uh, uh, Reddit post that uh, I found very interesting. I'll post a link to it in the chat as well, but I'm going to very quickly just read through the main post. Uh, so the post says, I applied to a PHP job and the interviewer sent me a test as following. Write a CRUD application connecting to Postgres, but please don't use full stack frameworks like Laravel, Symfony, or CodeIgniter. Also, don't use Apache or Nginx. Just use the built-in PHP server in Postgres and Postgres. That's it. Well, seems to be simple. Uh, this test is not for a junior position. It's supposed to be a senior PHP evaluation. So they are expecting that I will deliver some modern PHP code. I can't just sit down and write some 2005 like PHP script full of includes and procedural. Before I even think about the CRUD itself, I need to think about folder architecture, a bootstrap front uh, and controller, a routing component, some kind of basic templating system to display standard HTML views, something that at least resembles an ORM or well-organized data layer, not to mention basic validations, helpers, and of course, unit tests. I'm kind of lost and the imposter syndrome hit me very hard on this one. Seems like before attempting to uh, get any job interviews, I'm gonna need to start learning PHP from scratch. So this is a very interesting uh, Reddit uh, post and I strongly recommend people check it out and go through the comments. Um, it resonated with me because it's something that I've experienced a lot uh, over my years of hiring, not just with Playlog, but in other companies as well. And it leads me to my next slide which is all about our code tests. So um, we generally use uh, one code test continuously for the different departments. So um, our backend test has been modified, but generally the same over the past several years. Our front end tests modified to, uh, adjusted, to be adjusted for the specifics of where we're at in our hiring cycle. But again, 
uh, we touch on the same beats because we know the types of problems that we need to solve. Uh, and we know um, we have also data from previous people who have done the test in regards to what we can expect. So we continue to build this up as a, as a library and we can use it to uh, compare future hires. Uh, so as you see here, build a simple app slash CRUD backend from scratch, similar to what you saw in, in that test. Uh, the reason why I do this is because, um, well, actually, uh, I'm going to actually just go through the rest of these points here, and then I'll, I'll jump back to that. So some of the things that we look for when we're uh, assessing uh, the code tests are, how do you, uh, how you interpret the code test? Uh, did you follow the instructions of the test? Did you ask questions? Did you finish the test? Did you explain yourself? How much time did you spend on the test? Did you do any unnecessary work? <laughs> uh, and we're probably not gonna pay you <laughs> to do the test. Um, the reason why I wanted to go over that is, is because we don't necessarily need any one of those, any one of those things to be a perfect answer. There's no such thing as a perfect answer. There's no such thing as a perfect test back. You can send back the test and have it be completely a hundred percent technically accurate, but we're also looking at other things like um, if we say don't focus on fancy front end because this is a back end test, did you spend a, a bunch of time trying to get the front end set up and then you didn't have time to finish something else? Uh, or uh, did you misinterpret one of the instructions and then you didn't ask whether or not you were understanding right and then you built something incorrectly, right? This, this test is not just a coding test, but it's also supposed to be representative of uh, how you're going to work uh, with Again, whether it's the founders, managers, other team members, how you're going to communicate. This is the first steps uh, in that. Uh, and in regards to the not going to pay you aspect of it, uh, again, we're not looking for you to re reinvent the wheel or to come up with something that is uh, totally novel or to do something that hasn't been done before. Again, this is, this is our same common test. So if you see a code test and your first thought is, I don't uh, have time to work on this, then that's fine, uh, but this, you're not going to be the, the type of person that's going to um, uh, integrate well with the rest of our team. Question number three <laughs> in regards to working with a team, are you a good culture fit? Uh, so what type of environment do you thrive in right now? Uh, everybody's working remotely. Some people are not good at working remotely, right? So that's something that's important. How self-directed are you? When we first uh, got started, after we had our first uh, three hires, I manually co-reviewed everything, Android, iOS, as well as web. Even though I wasn't as uh, proficient in Android and iOS, it was uh, a way for me to become more familiar with it and to see exactly what they were doing and be able to ask them questions about how they're doing things. Now, we're in a position where we have uh, more people, uh, other people can code review themselves, and I wanna make sure that I'm not acting as a bottleneck. So anybody that we hire on board needs to be the type of person that doesn't need to be uh, directly supervised all the time. You need to be able to uh, get context from what's being said, prepare, uh, document what you're doing, and be basically be able to work somewhat independently. Uh, another thing is, what do you like to work on? Th this somewhat goes to the engineering versus product development type of things. Do you like to solve abstract technical challenges or do you like to, uh, the, the satisfaction of having a, a finished product that has a label that goes out into the world and people can see? Uh, and depending on the type of things that you like to, to work on is going to depend on uh, <laughs> whether or not we hire you in a particular phase of development. When we get into the engineering aspect of things, we're gonna be wanting those types of people, but right now we have to filter those, filter them out. Uh, so an example I have here is uh, also is accounting software versus games, right? Um, a game developer is not gonna to wanna to do any type of uh, <laughs> a boring database management unless they can throw some pretty colors or something onto it or they can gamify it. Whereas an accounting, somebody who wants to do accounting software doesn't want to worry about uh, making sure the user feels rewarded for pressing a button, right? Very different things, very different uh, attention to detail that you're going to be spending, despite the fact that we have designers or QA team, right? The person who's making it is going to be focusing on different things and it's going to uh, affect the quality of the end product. And then how well do you work with others? Uh, or do others have to work well with you? Again, this has been mentioned in previous slides, but uh, if, you're, if you're not able to integrate into the rest of the team, 
if, if everybody is having to, to bend to you, then you're going to be a point of friction. And this is not, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not good. It, it's something that uh, we're, we're eventually, is eventually going to boil over and it's going to end with somebody needing to uh, leave the situation. See who shall not be named. Um, so before, uh, in, in the in the before times, we were uh, partly remote, partly in person. So we would do two days uh, work in person in an office a week, Mondays and Thursdays, and the rest of the time was remote. The reason for this was because I'm generally pro remote work, but especially at the beginning stages when we're still trying to figure out uh, exactly what it is we're building, figuring out our processes, having that face-to-face -face time really helps with um, breaking down communication barriers, just getting people comfortable with each other. Uh, if you're in the same room, it's a lot easier to start a conversation with somebody that you don't know than it is hypothetically to uh, send a DM or start a video conversation with somebody over Slack that you've never had a conversation with before. So I felt that because we were doing that, we were able to really kickstart the team building of our core team. And when we did move fully remote, it made it a lot easier for new hires to become integrated into the team because our existing members were um, acting as examples for our, our new hires. Um, yeah, and strong communication skills has been uh, something that has been key to our hiring process as well, especially now that we are remote. If you're not able to articulate what it is that you're working on, the problems that you're facing, why something is or isn't a good idea, then not only are uh, we gonna be in a worse situation for not having been able to get the knowledge, but you're gonna feel frustrated as well because you're not gonna feel like you're being heard. Um, so to uh, a, a phrase that I, I uh, analogy is uh, when you're having a conversation, you have the transmitter and the receiver. It's the transmitter job to make sure that they're, what they're transmitting can be translated by the receiver and the receiver needs to do their best to decode the message from the translator. Both sides need to happen and that's both skills need to be there for anybody that we hire. Uh, and <laughs> uh, more of a, a negative thing that I've noticed since working fully remote and bringing on uh, new developers is that people start have started working overtime without letting me know that they're actually working overtime. Uh, a part of this is because we're stuck at home and some of our developers don't have a lot else to do other than work. But this, this causes problems because if I'm thinking that they're working 40 hours a week with a certain output and they're actually working 60 hours a week, then I start to come up with inaccurate timelines for our roadmaps on what we can do if we need to go into a crunch time. And I'm like, okay, guys, we need to start doing a little bit of overtime, unfortunately. And they're like, we're already doing it. Bad, bad time. Uh, how much time do I have? As much as you like, mate. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, I'll try to rush these ones. So a couple of the things that I've noticed uh, is that when hiring, you're influenced uh, by the surroundings that you're in, right? So something I've seen in Toronto is that uh, there's a lot of developers from banks, which isn't uh, inherently a bad thing, but uh, when you're trying to do like a fast moving uh, social media startup, uh, there's a bit of a culture rub there, right? So we don't do a strict nine to five. We're more get the job done and be available. But if you need that uh, regimen in order to be effective at what you do, then startup or at least the start probably isn't gonna be the best for you, right? If you need something that's more like a, a waterfall um, type of system where everything is predetermined beforehand, then again, this is not really going to be an environment that you're going to thrive in, right? Our focus, uh, I like to call what we do agile light. Um, we're, we're fairly iterative. We, we try and populate as many issues into our issue boards in advance as possible, but we do change things rapidly based off of uh, what, what happens in the world, the trends in the industry, and uh, unexpected things that happen. So uh, that's uh, just part of the game here, right? So um, yeah, and we notice there's there's lots of people, lots of developers who are super, super strong with general CRUD principles. I've used CRUD, the term CRUD multiple times during this talk, it stands for create, read, update, delete. So most apps uh, that connect to the internet are CRUD apps, at least foundationally. But um, you need we need people who are able to uh, work outside of the uh, traditional, not just the traditional CRUD framework, but um, do more than than just that, right? So 
We need people who are able to do things like work with uh, custom UIs as opposed to the pre-built UI, right? If you're doing, again, like a banking app or you're doing some type of a list app or something where the branding is uh, ends at making sure you have the right color palette, then using system UIs is, uh, is recommended even because you don't want to waste a bunch of time. But uh, for something like social media uh, where uh, images <laughs> is a big, big part of the game, um, there's a lot of little details and custom things that we want to do, or even things that we want to look the same across Android and iOS that don't look the same out of the box. And if you are just familiar with using the pre-built UI systems, your default reaction to that is not just not necessarily that it can't be done, but that you shouldn't do it. That it's almost taboo to not use Apple's UI guidelines, despite having business reasons for doing that. Right. So. Um, again, where you're working and uh, the things that you've touched on is going to influence what, uh, how you feel about those types of things. Do you have any type of visual aesthetics? Again, um, so something that I've, I've noticed with a, with a couple of our hires as well uh, when they first started off is that um, they can be given visual mockups, but if the mockups don't necessarily have animations to it, they're not going to spend a bunch of time trying to make sure the animation is... Uh, particularly smooth. If it animates, then it animates, and that's mission accomplished. But then you need to get our UI, uh, UX person to go in and be like, you know, that animation is, is going for five seconds. It needs to go for three and a half. And the radius of that is 35 degrees. And it needs to be 25 degrees. And that little, those those types of things that uh, even if you have the design, you're not, you're not even necessarily going to be uh, looking at that. You might just say, okay, curved. So I'm going to curve the edges. Um, and so because the your surroundings influence uh, the talent pool so much, we have uh, looked outside of the city for people. Uh, we've looked uh, in uh, Tokyo, we've looked in California, we've looked in other places in uh, Canada as well. And uh, some of the obvious things that we've run into, challenges with that is scheduling across time zones can get complicated. Uh, language barriers, if you're trying to communicate with your the Japanese iOS developer and he's telling you something and you can't tell if he knows what he's talking about or if he is just having a uh, English issue, then that's a problem. Uh, and salary expectations as well, right? You can have uh, two people with the exact same credentials from two different cities, but uh, if they're living in California and they're paying $3,000 for a bachelor apartment, then they have different needs, uh, right? So uh yeah let's see here uh so yeah so just a, a summary of some of the general challenges that we found um obviously there's a high demand for uh the top talents um so just competition in general also um i have uh a limited technical vocabulary i have a technical vocabulary i know the things that i want to do and the ways that i do things from a web developer and a game developer but i don't necessarily always know how to translate that into um native uh ios or android terms or how to uh explain that without explaining how the uh, explain something ex without explaining how the render pipeline for your browser works right so uh, that's that's when I'm trying to come up with uh, job descriptions <laughs> to, for for Adam, and then we get people in, and we're like, okay, so this person was right, this person was wrong, tweak it, use this language from their resume, and that's that's how I continue to um, educate myself as well. It, one way I continue to, to do that. Um, yeah, another thing I put here is a strange flavor combination. So um, sometimes we need a, a collection of technologies uh, in one person that isn't necessarily uh, very common. Uh, that obviously makes it very hard, right? Um, you, that, that, there's enough said there, I think. Um, and then getting all this fancy stuff comes with experience, which means a higher salary. Obviously, we don't want to underpay anybody, uh, but we need to make sure that we can afford people and that we're not going to uh, run out of, like, burn through our runway. Um, another thing with more experienced developers often comes a desire for security. Uh, but we can't necessarily, we're a startup. Uh, we, we can't guarantee you security. We can guarantee you a degree of security. We can say, this is where our runway is. We know that we're going to exist up until this point. And then at that point, if we, if we hit A, B, and C, we keep going. If we haven't, then we don't. Some people are okay with that. Some people thrive in that. Some people have a family, <laughs> right? Or they have some, uh, some other type of, uh, they just, they just need that stability. So, that obviously narrows down the pool. 
Um, and then being a PhD doesn't mean that you can do a job, uh, do the job. Being a rock star also doesn't mean that you can do the job. Um, the PhD thing, again, it goes to the engineering versus product development type of uh, thing. Uh, narrow uh, scope versus broad scope. Uh, and the rock star, just because you hear a bunch of good things about a developer, one of our developers, we were uh, we were having other interviews where we're like, oh, you hired that person? I can't believe it. I've used that person's library for years. And we were like, this is going to be uh, this is going to be great. And then they were good at what they did, but they were really not suitable for what we hired them for. Uh, so again. Um, <laughs> you have to really spend a lot of time to make sure the individual fits your particular needs. Uh, and <laughs> finally, I want the person that I'm hiring to know more than I do, uh, but I still need them to show me <laughs> a certain level of respect. There's gonna be, uh, I, like I've mentioned multiple times, I am not a native Android developer. I'm not a native iOS developer. I'm looking for people who are going to be able to say, this is how you do something in iOS. This is how you don't do it. And I'm going to need to be able to tell them, but what about this? Explain to me why this idea doesn't work. Uh, explain to me why uh, we need, need to do this instead of this. Uh, or yeah, just any type any type of, of situation like that. And so if you are coming in or any developer is coming in with an attitude of, I know better than other people, again, it's just not going to work. And the more it happens more with people who are skilled, right? Uh, they, they had a certain level of confidence that can turn into arrogance and then it kind of blows up. So uh, jumping to today, uh, we now have a tech team of about 12 people. We have four mobile developers, three, three people on our back end team, one person on a front end web, one full stack developer to help out with the front end and the back end as needed, a DevOps person and two QA developers. Uh, I'm happy to say that most of the people that we've hired uh, have stuck with us over the past three and a half years, uh, including two or three initial hires. Our biggest challenge has been on the iOS side. And I attribute that partly to, again, a uh, learning curve on my end, learning how to communicate to the intricacies of people in certain technical environments with certain uh, ecosystems and perspectives that I wasn't a part of, uh, as well as just um, <laughs> some unfortunate uh, uh, hiring necessities, uh, limited limited time, having to choose the best that was available as opposed to the best. It happens. Uh, yeah, and that's that's where I'm at for that. So uh, I guess thanks for listening to my TED talk. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, what do you think about Flutter for development of a mobile app for semi-heavy computational app, geo-based? Ah. Uh, so I haven't used Flutter specifically, but my general guidelines is um, uh, anything that's doing custom uh, a custom UI is going to be doing extra overhead. So really uh, test it out first and see what see what it is that you need to do. So it's really trial and error. If you haven't used a particular technology before, test it out first. Get familiar with it before you try and do anything with it in production. Uh, once you know that, then you, then you do it. If you don't know, then the question is. Uh, is there a reason why you're trying to work with technologies that you haven't used before? Um, yeah, if, if it's a learning project or if you are in a particular scenario where all parties involved understand that we're doing experimental things that we don't understand what the end result is going to be, then that's fine. Um, but again, it's really what is your goal? Is it to learn something uh, or is it to get a product made as fast as possible and get it out into people? What do you think about Japanese designers? I guess maybe oh. um, maybe different kind of design aesthetics. I mean, I know we mentioned mm -hmm. that we, we hired a couple of people in Japan specifically because it was a, another talent pool that we mm -hmm. kind of looked at. Um, have you noticed any kind of maybe? Um, yeah. So there, there's, there's two, there's two uh, things to, to touch on that. Um, there is the, uh, the visual component of it, uh, let's say the art, and then there's actual like UI design. So uh, in regards to the uh, like visual arts, I love Japanese 
uh, artistic aesthetics. They tend to do a lot of really crazy experimental things. I love the way that they work with colors and then but um, in regards to UI, it's a very different situation because the language is different. You can convey more information in a single character of Japanese or any uh, uh, CJK, so Japanese characters, Chinese characters, Korean characters, things like that, uh, than you can in English. So when they're doing uh, web design or app design, they try to do it in such a way where they can get as much information onto the screen as possible versus uh, design in English where you try and give a lot of space uh, and not clutter it because it becomes overwhelming. So those two things I feel can clash if you're uh, a Japanese uh, designer trying to design something for a North American audience. Your brand might be on point, uh, but the actual uh, UI for the app or website uh, might need to have adjustments to show less information or give uh, more room for the information on, on the screen to breathe. Yeah, I think uh, Justin, the CEO of Playlog, had mentioned some time ago, he told me a story about uh, when Twitter moved to Japan. They're like, oh, do it this way. And they're like, no, that's not going to work. And they're like, no, all right, you guys just do it how you want to do it, and we'll just kind of take your word for it. So they basically got free reign to just design the app how they wanted. Yeah. Yeah, Twitter Japan and uh, Yahoo Japan are both uh, autonomous. And uh, you might laugh when, if, when I say Yahoo Japan, but in Japan, Yahoo is is huge. Like they have, I think they have like a bank. <laughs> um, oh wow! So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's 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 wild there. Um, yeah. Apparently, TCS Tata Consultancy Services have a car company too, which I thought was really? weird. But yeah, Seven yeah. Eleven yeah. also has a bank in Japan. <laughs> wow. Okay. There yeah. you go. Just like, hey, we got so much money. Let's let's open a bank. Mm -hmm. Any horror stories worth sharing? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's hear it. Let's go. Okay, so uh, I'll just let's I'll, not name I'll, any names. I'm not going to name any names, but um, the the iOS hiring process for Playlog was my my biggest challenge from the beginning, and I'll I'll go through the the key points as fast as I can. So our first hire, um, I don't think he actually believed in the product. I'm pretty sure he was just looking for a job, uh, and in about six months he. He left the company to do something with a friend of his. So that sucks. So we, we want to hire another person. And our next iOS developer, this was on me. Uh, I feel that I hired him because I had a bias because he had a game development background. And I figured that that would make it easier for us to communicate. But unfortunately, um, I, for whatever reason, I, I'm going to assume it was personal problems at some point. Well, the, the work he started doing at the beginning wasn't particularly fast. And it kept getting slower and slower to the point where he just wasn't working. We got to a point where it was it was a Christmas break, and he's like, "I'm going to catch up over the break." And then he just didn't. So I'm like, "Okay, well, the, you you told me that you're going to do a specific thing. Not only did you not do it, but you can't even justify it. So we have to let you go." Which was the first time I had to fire somebody, and that was fun. Um, so at that point, um, we had gone through two iOS developers, and we were about a year into development. Uh, so Android was much, much further, and we were starting to try and come up with some deadlines. And so um, I was telling our, my co-founder that uh, if we're going to, we either need to change our deadlines or we need to hire uh, a couple of developers because now we, we have we have more things to do as well. So previously, it didn't make sense to have multiple developers. It'd be too many cooks in the kitchen. Now we have multiple things. It was mandatory. So we tried to do an approach of having one person working on the app and one person doing R&D type of stuff for both Android and iOS. And then they would both code review each other's work. So uh, our R&D guy on the iOS side left us for Apple, which is, you know, uh, good for him. Uh, we can't compete with that yet. Um, <laughs> but then that left us with our other uh, developer who was one of the people that we also, uh, he was what I consider to be a rushed hire. He was the best out of the batch, but he wasn't necessarily um, a perfect fit. And we hired him thinking, we'll, we'll try it out and see. We have another iOS developer. They're going to be code reviewing each other. So uh, if one person isn't carrying their weight, the other person is going to be able to indicate. We lost one of our iOS developers. We lost that check. We hire on another iOS developer. I figured that the check would be good. 
but unfortunately, and this was actually when we hired uh, the, the rock star, right? So we're like, okay, so you guys are gonna code review each other's work. Um, they were code reviewing each other's work, but they're both doing subpar work. So, uh, <laughs> it, and we ended up in a situation where it seemed like we were making forward progress, but uh, the underlying code was uh, toxic. And by the time we, we got to the point where the toxicity was becoming apparent, uh we were we were deep into the development cycle so we let them both go uh hired uh i'm gonna skip over that particular point hired another two developers to basically refactor as much as they could uh and just rush to try and catch up which miraculously they did so this was the, the third time was the charm um and to be, to be completely honest with you, uh, again, it was uh, the personality at the, end of the, at the end of the day that made these particular developers work over the the uh, the rest of them. Um, even in these two, there's a there's a discrepancy in their technical capabilities, but the fact that they're able to express what they're working on, we're able to work with them now effectively. So not only have we uh, significantly caught up from where uh from our errors from before uh but we're now starting to surpass them and i expect our ios um development to actually uh surpass android in the next month or so so yeah Sweet. that's yeah i hope that was uh horrific enough with a happy ending <laughs> Yeah, definitely. No, it's it'd be great to see kind of Playlog come so far and super excited for, for 2021 to see where you guys are. Obviously, mm -hmm. we've, we've got a great audience and I think you guys are genuinely solving a problem of kind of rapidly creating content um, for people easily. So how do you overcome the challenge that a startup has in closing a hire, work flexibility, work challenges, options? Well, uh, <laughs> the... Uh, the biggest part of that for us is just making sure that the person that we're hiring uh, understands what they're getting into, right? So uh, right off the bat, it was like, listen, we're we're a startup. If you're going to work here, it's because you you like what we're doing. Uh, we're in a we're we're in a, a, a unique situation in that uh, at least for the seed stage, um, we're able to uh, we we don't have a funding problem for the early stage, so we can at least say that. Uh, you're going to be able to get a competitive salary. Um, you're going to get um, like some limited uh, uh, health benefits. You're going to get stock in the company. And uh, we have a, uh, a work style that is like this. And if that is the type of environment that you feel that you can thrive in, then let's continue the conversation. If not, then no, no harm, no foul. Thank you for your time. Um, and I guess... Another thing I can add to that as well is I had the same perspective of who's going to want to work for us when we don't have uh, any track record, we don't have proof of stability. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, kind of uh, different uh, and we don't know if it's going to succeed. And what I found is that uh, <laughs> it didn't really matter. Um, you, you're still going to get people, num number one, uh, 90, I think 90% of the people who are looking for work, they don't actually bother to research uh, the companies beforehand. They're just looking for a paycheck. Um, <laughs> actually, I had a, a conversation recently about a friend about crypto, and, was, and he's like, so uh, do you consider yourself a gambler? And I'm like, no. He's like, but you're you're going pretty heavy into crypto. And I'm like, well, I can, I've done a bunch of research, and I have a general education on the industry when you go to look for a job do you do research onto who the founders are and whether or not the company is going to be solvent in six months and he's like no I'm like well do you consider yourself a gambler mm -hmm. right so um yeah that that just that hasn't really been a major issue i don't think um, awesome. not for us probably for you <laughs> looking for people but uh, by the time they filter to us as well then it's it's a different situation yeah yeah i would like to chime in there as well um because the, the question was how do you overcome the challenge that a startup in specifically closing a hire now working mm. in the recruitment space myself 
every time I speak to a candidate from conversation number one, it's a pitch about the company and why they'd want to work there. I got my play log pitch down, Pat. Mm-hmm. But one of the one of the also super important questions I ask is is Jeff, Jane, Jim, why are you looking for work? Mm-hmm. What are you looking to take from a new opportunity? And once you have that information on the why they're open to conversations and why they're looking for work, throughout the process, you can come back to them and they might say, oh, look, I hate my, I hate my boss. I want more money. I'm undervalued. I'm not learning anything. And then at the end of the process, you can bring that out and say, hey, well, look, when we first, when we first mentioned, when we first, you know, kind of uh, when we had a first interview, you said that these are key factors. If you were to join a company like Envision, we can offer you X, Y, and Z. And ideally, you want to be kind of complimenting and giving them a reason to leave. Well, you don't like your boss. Well, this is my work style. What didn't you like about them? Oh, cool. Well, he's super micromanagement. We're going to give you a lot of freedom and autonomy. So you're kind of selling to why they're kind of looking to leave. One other piece of advice I have as well is, um, I don't know if you guys have an internal recruiter or anything there, but debrief with the candidate at interview and specifically ask them, how did you feel? How did you feel you got on? Is this really a position that you feel you would like to do do you think we got along is this an interesting role is this an interesting company because if they say oh look to be honest i'm I'm not too sure i have this other role don't progress forward with them don't waste time dragging someone through the process um and then try or close them as well it's kind of a recruitment you know kind of jazzy term but basically jim if we offered you x would you accept the role based on what you know so far and again if that answer is no or i'm not sure they need more information um, but, uh, yeah, definitely. Hopefully that's, uh, been able to, to answer your question there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll just, I'll, I'll piggyback one extra, extra thought on there as well. Um, I'm terrible at selling things. I don't actually even think I properly described what play log was in my talk there. Um, but, um, this is why we have Adam as well to do more of the selling of the company. So by the time we have our candidate candidates here, um, I'm not selling them on anything i'm telling them this is what you're going to get right and i think that um because i'm not trying to sell them on the company it also helps to uh at least build up a little bit of of trust in regards to what it is that we're doing despite the fact that we are kind of unknown and on the other side as well we tend to reject candidates who are overly selling themselves if they're talking if they're name dropping and talking about how amazing they are then that's not really the type of thing that we want we want to hear about how you did the things that you did not all of the achievements that you've made so um that's probably a little bit of uh, extra thought on there but uh, it just mm-hmm. it came to mind when you were when you were mentioning that adam yeah yeah definitely no and just to kind of again kind of jump on that as well playlog essentially a digital content creation tool that mm. lower the barrier of entry for content creation so instead of needing a laptop and a video recorder and all this fancy kit you can download an app and create podcasts in literally 15 20 seconds as opposed to the hours it's going to take you learning video editing software is a pain in the ass the playlog really just lowers the barrier of entry it makes that super easy so i, I think you guys are going to yeah. Do that's the tag team in action right there. That's yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs>